Okay, so um, we've covered seismic techniques and we have covered um, uh, gravity and magnetic techniques, which I uh, refer to as uh, potential field techniques, gravity and magnetics. And now it's time to uh, look at a few case histories that uh, combine uh, one or hopefully uh, all three of these techniques to uh, uh, get some important information uh, and uh, uh, you know, solve a problem, uh, solve a geological uh, question, or uh, perhaps uh, find some resources, energy resources, mineral resources, or uh, help with uh, to clean up some uh, some pollution. So, uh, I'm going to kind of go through um, a few examples in different areas, and uh, I just want to mention real quickly hydrocarbon exploration, which is uh, you know really uh, the endeavor that most geophysicists in the world are involved in and one of the most successful. So this is uh, oil and gas exploration uh, done with uh, both um, uh, seismic and electrical and, 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 and also uh, potential field techniques, but mainly, uh, mainly seismic. Like other, uh, other resources, oil and gas uh, occur as fluids within the four space of of rocks, and if you have a coarse, clean sand, the uh, you know well sorted, uh, uh, then the porosity uh, phi can be uh, you know up to thirty percent, uh, probably less. And if it's an older, deeply buried rock, probably a whole lot less. You know, one percent, three percent might be kind of average for uh, pre-tertiary uh, um, granular porosities, but um, uh, you know, it's possible to have up to thirty uh, percent porosity uh, in the uh, um, in the sand pore space, and that uh, uh, you know that's pore space that not only uh, leads to uh, uh, porosity and uh, and a quantity of, of resources, it also uh, you know the the porosity between grains of uh, of sediment, uh, granular porosity, uh, like in a in a uh, coarse, well-sorted, uh, clean sand uh, that's uh, able to support as well uh, quite a bit of uh, permeability. So the fluid is able to move through that rock. Um, it's not just uh, trapped within that uh, within that rock. Uh, now, of course, as you um, as the 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 grain size gets finer, and of course uh, you get down to silt and clay size, and uh, and the porosity. Uh, um, can become uh, much less, especially in older rocks. Um, and as you uh, as you put in more uh, uh, more poorly sorted, uh, uh, you know, more more grains of different sizes, then they'll also the finer grains will fill the the pore space between the the coarser grains. Um, so thirty percent is a maximum, but uh, it's not unheard of to find oil reservoirs with that uh, kind of porosity. Now, oil and gas have a lower density than uh, than water or brine. Okay, um, you know brine can have a density considerably above uh, 1.0 grams per uh, cubic centimeter, and uh, water naturally is uh, going to be somewhere uh, very close to 1.0 grams per cubic centimeter. And oil and gas, uh, well, oil um, uh, could well have a uh, uh, a density that's uh, you know only ninety percent of the water density, uh, and and uh, if these uh, fluids are uh, um, are not too contaminated by uh, sulfur compounds and, and other things uh, that are undesirable in, in, in to the environment in burning the the oil anyway, um, the the oil can be quite mobile. It's hot. Uh, uh, down at uh, reservoir depths and will uh, will move in uh, um, as as if you present it with the opportunity to uh, move up and buoyantly uh, uh, come towards the surface it will it will do so and of course natural gas uh, is occurring as a free gas it's not dissolved uh, only rarely is it dissolved within the uh, uh, within water or, or oil in the in the pore space it's uh, uh, it's it's it can easily be a free gas in the uh, 
uh, in the pore space. And of course, then it's very mobile. So the uh, the oil and gas mi will migrate from us from source rocks, you know, shales, uh, organic rich uh, rocks, to a reservoir. All right. Now this is uh, old style uh, uh, energy resources, and uh, the uh, the new uh, uh, frac oil resources that we have in Elko County that are just being developed now. Uh, basically, they're going to drill into the source rocks, which uh, probably still trap the uh, the oil from uh, the organics that they contained uh, when they were laid down, uh, which can be as old as uh, the the Cambrian, and then it's going uh, the the frac process uh, creates not the porosity, but it creates the permeability that allows uh, extraction of those uh, of those hydrocarbons. Uh, the same with uh, with frac gas. Uh, but um, uh, and that so uh, frac oil, frac gas just require the source rocks. Uh, in our uh, classical uh, uh, and and this is the way that you know up until uh, five years ago, almost all uh, oil has been produced. You migrate that that oil from the source rock to a reservoir, and uh, what do you need for a reservoir? Well, you need uh, you know permeable and porous. Uh, uh, rock reservoir rock, and then you have to bound that that reservoir by a trap that prevents further upward migration of the oil and gas. Because you know, if uh, without the trap over geologic time, certainly the oil and gas will continue to migrate upward and, and come out onto the uh, onto the surface as uh, uh, as uh, gas uh, seeps and and oil seeps uh, tar. Um, uh, tar pits and, and that sort of thing. So um, uh, the reservoir needs uh, needs the trap on top of it. So there are um, uh, several exploration methods for uh, uh, for uh, uh, hydrocarbons, and um, the principal ones that we'll talk about are in this class are structural, okay, uh, and uh, we identify traps and uh, and reservoirs and source rocks with seismic uh, reflection imaging um, and sometimes seismic refraction velocity uh, uh, inversions and uh, occasionally with uh, with gravity uh, and magnetic surveys. Um, about a hundred years ago, uh, the Schlumberger brothers. Um, uh, worked on electrical methods of identifying uh, oil reservoirs and traps, and of course then by by drilling. Okay, so this concept of finding the uh, the structural traps, okay, that uh, uh, that can involve all of these techniques. Uh, much oil in the last twenty years has been found in stratigraphic traps, uh, where faults are are not necessarily playing a role, where folding is not necessarily playing a role. Um, and those uh, stratigraphic traps, uh, you know, have to be found by uh, drilling and logging, uh, along with uh, extremely high quality and, and densely uh, spaced seismic reflection imaging. So seismic imaging uh, had uh, uh, revolutionized the stratigraphic search for uh, oil and gas, uh, and and now in in Nevada. Uh, Northeast Nevada for the frac oil, the problem is is not stratigraphic but structural. Okay, we kind of know where the uh, where the uh, um, the source rocks are that we could frac to produce uh, oil and gas, uh, but uh, they're beaten up and um, those formations are are disrupted by uh, faulting of many many different generations, many different orogenies, and so it becomes a structural problem as well. To be able to uh, figure out where that, uh, um, uh, where those, uh, um, uh, where those uh, uh, stratigraphic, uh, uh, where the where those uh, shales are, okay, how deep they are, where they're interrupted by faults, where they get faulted down to, all all those are questions that uh, the 3D seismic surveys done by Noble Energy and others uh, have have answered. Okay. Now there's also uh, 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 the subject of direct detection of um, of uh, oil and gas, 
and uh, being that uh, you know the brines you find at oil reservoir depths are quite conductive, and and the uh, the hydrocarbons themselves, when you know you have a pool in a reservoir of uh, you know very high uh, uh, proportion of hydrocarbons, you know without much of that brine, uh, then uh, you know maybe electrical surveys and electromagnetic surveys are capable of of uh, revealing the uh, um, the location of those pools of, of oil or gas, okay? Because the uh, uh, you know, especially relative to the brines, the oil and gas themselves are insulators, all right. And um, and then uh, there are many seismic methods for direct detection of hydrocarbons, and uh, that play off the uh, the the rather different uh, uh, seismic character characteristics. And the special properties of uh, of oil and gas reservoirs containing these light fluids, you know, looking for uh, uh, things like the uh, uh, the the level, perfectly level potentiometric surface of the of the uh, of the water oil interface cutting across stratigraphy, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, now, there's also uh, some interesting um, uh, possibilities for using uh, magnetic and electrical uh, techniques to detect the uh, the higher uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility and the higher uh, electrical conductivity of some of the minerals that uh, uh, are formed uh, when uh, when oil pools and uh, uh, and devolves out of uh, out of the source rocks and when it pools in reservoirs. Um, there was a USGS program for years that. Uh, Looked at uh, uh, identifying oil reservoirs around salt domes by their uh, uh, the diagenetically uh, uh, induced uh, magnetite and and pyrites that uh, um, tend to gather around uh, the edges of a uh, the fringes of a of an oil reservoir. So there's uh, structural, stratigraphic, direct detection, and diagenetic ways of using geophysics to uh, to find oil and gas. Uh, I could mention, for instance, uh, that a uh, simple structural trap brought about by a salt dome um, would would be a gravity low, right? Because the salt that's uh, thickened uh, underneath the salt dome, uh, underneath the dome, is um, is less dense, so it would be a gravity hole, um, and uh, seismically, you would see a um, uh, seismically, you would see the the, the structural uh, uh, high that uh, 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 that would accompany that uh, doming up, um, and then perhaps around the fringes of the uh, of the domed oil field, uh, you would see uh, magnetic minerals and higher magnetic susceptibilities. You'd also see uh, greater conductivity in kind of a rim around the uh, uh, the low conductivity oil. So uh, there's quite a few uh, uh, possibilities. You know, uh, you'd have a gravity. Let's see, salt dome oil would have uh, uh, gravity low and a magnetic high. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a structural dome or aniform that's uh, produced by, uh, you know, say a basement uplift, you know, the basement is probably more magnetic than the sediments. So you'd have a magnetic high, and the basement is uh, more. Uh, Dense than the than the sediments, so you'd also have a gravity high, and above it you would see you could see the same uh, structural dome. Okay, so that's uh, uh, just a little bit for your uh, for your consideration. Um, I'm going to talk about um, um, mostly uh, for for uh, uh, Monday about uh, groundwater exploration and development. And I'm going to break it down into a couple of different uh, hydrologic uh, problems. All right. Um, one thing I'm not going to talk about is the uh, brilliant new capabilities that we have, uh, even right here at UNR, in uh, Scott Tyler's uh, Center for Distributed Temperature Measurement uh, for environmental and uh, and hydrologic purposes. Uh, those brilliant new capabilities we have to measure temperature at very high resolution in space and time. Using optical fibers and reflectometers, uh, this is a uh, uh, still uh, geophysics essentially, and uh, brings some amazing new capabilities. 
So um, in, uh, in groundwater exploration, there's the problem of locating an aquifer and then of assessing the, qua the quality of, that, of the water in that aquifer, the volume of the aquifer, and thus the volume of water that could be produced. And then uh, the permeability of the of the aquifer. Can we produce? How easily can we produce that aquifer? Okay. Or are we gonna have to drill a well? You know, if we have to drill a well every uh, every square decameter, you know, every ten meters, uh, to extract that water, then uh, it's because the the aquifer is impermeable. Uh, then it's not gonna be worthwhile. Uh, there's also problems in uh, in uh, groundwater development. That um, uh, geophysics can help with, uh, you know, just by uh, uh, locating the boundaries of the aquifer, we can help a lot with uh, modeling of, of withdrawal and recharge, uh, uh, withdrawal uh, of water from the aquifer, recharge of water to the aquifer. Okay, uh, really, just by setting limits on the uh, um, on on the possible uh, uh, extent of the aquifer. Uh, helps that a lot, and this is critical in deciding, you know, how you how you can develop the aquifer. How much can you pump every year? Um, you know, questions like that. Uh, and then there's uh, problems of pollution control. You know, you want to uh, locate uh, any sources of pollution. You want to be able to track the spread of any uh, uh, pollution plumes. Okay. Now uh, traditionally. All of these problems got uh, addressed with expensive drilling and pumping tests. Okay, I mean you can drill and locate an aquifer. You can assess uh, directly the water quality, and uh, you can make some guesses about volume, and you can measure permeability, uh, and you could put that all into a uh, an aquifer model with with more guesses, you know, from further wells, uh, and, and you know that tell you something about the extent of the aquifer. You can. You can model withdrawal and recharge, okay, um, and and current law says that uh, you have to um, when there's a pollution plume that has to be worked on, like at all uh, Superfund sites, um, you have to drill monitoring wells uh, and lots of them, okay, uh, both to locate the source and attract the spread of the uh, of the pollution. So these, uh, uh, you know, solving these problems with uh, uh, with drilling and, and pump tests is really expensive. Okay, so what can we do with geophysics? You know, that might uh, might help us. Uh, you know, even if we uh, are, are having to plan a uh, a monitoring well field, you know, at a at a polluted site, uh, we can still use geophysics to make that uh, that monitoring much more efficient. And instead of you know punching holes everywhere or in a grid. We can decide how to how to punch holes in a uh, um, in in a much more efficient way. Okay, so um, you know what can we what can we get out of out of geophysics? All right, what are some objectives that we can that we can try uh, to solve with our geophysics? All right, there's uh, aquifer geometry. We can locate water bearing formations. We can, in some case. Quantify their porosity, and we can locate uh, aquacludes or aquitards, okay, which are the uh, uh, the traps and seals that uh, prevent uh, or hinder uh, the movement of uh, of water, okay, um, and uh, uh, you know really a very you know the, the first order uh, technique geophysical technique to bring to that is gravity um, because you can characterize a fairly large aquifer. A fairly extensive aquifer, most efficiently with uh, with gravity, maybe with gravity data that somebody else has already taken. It just needs a correct analysis, and I'll show you an example of that uh, at the uh, end of this lecture. All right. Uh, now, of course, uh, if we're talking about uh, you know looking at the bottom of a of, of an aquifer where the aquifer is the uh, is basin sediments, right, sedimentary rock. And uh, below that is a, is an aquaclude, which is uh, you know say hard rock, basement rock. Okay, then you know seismic refraction is a, is a wonderful way to uh, locate the uh, uh, the basin floor and uh, and to get the uh, geometry and volume of the uh, of the aquifer. 
Likewise, we can re use resistivity um, to, uh, you know, if we do resistivity measurements at many places, uh, we might be able to define the, uh, the bottom of the aquifer that way. Uh, electromagnetic measurements, uh, uh, kind of the same way. Um, I'll show you some examples of seismic reflection used to get aquifer geometry. Uh, and we might imagine, uh, at least if we have additional data, uh, more than just magnetics, uh, magnetics can be helpful in, in locating, in figuring out aquifer geometry. Then, of course, borehole geophysics uh, can be very, uh, uh, a very crucial, uh, um, a very crucial component of, uh, you know, once we've defined the generalities of the aquifer, maybe we need to go into detail and, uh, and see, you know, within one uh, stack of, uh, of, of sediment, what, uh, you know, where, what are the, uh, which of the uh, uh, elements of that stack uh, uh, will have the, uh, uh, the highest porosity and permeability. Um, now, aquifers can be found in, in basement rocks uh, within fault zones or, or for instance, fractured uh, uh, sills and uh, 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 dikes, uh, say, within a uh, granite batholith. Uh, very, very common for homeowners even here uh, on the fringes of the uh, Sierra Nevada to produce water from uh, such, such zones. Okay, and so... Um, uh, you know that how how do we uh, get the geometry of that uh, of that dike? Okay, that's a that's a question we might be able to answer, say with uh, resistivity or uh, uh, or electromagnetics or or magnetics. Okay. Uh, now, you know, just finding um, a quantity of water is not the end of the story. Okay. Uh, no one's going to be able to develop that uh, that water resource if it doesn't have sufficient quality. Okay, so uh, there are geophysical ways of distinguishing pore waters on the basis of their salinity or their total dissolved solids. Why is that? Because the higher the salinity, the more conductive the water. So resistivity techniques, electromagnetic techniques, uh, borehole electrical techniques—they're all very useful for assessing water quality. And we'll examine some of those uh, later on when we talk about um, electrical and electromagnetic uh, um, electrical and electromagnetic case histories. All right. Uh, now, also um, there are aspects of uh, you know where are the sources of uh, groundwater, where are the sinks, uh, you know, is the groundwater all uh, uh, is it coming from the river or is it going into the river? Okay, um, you know how is the uh, the water table, the potentiometric surface of the of the water in any given aquifer? How does that vary? Okay, um, these are uh, uh, these are all questions that uh, that it's also sometimes possible to get a geophysical answer for. And here's where the temperature measurements come in. Okay, uh, such as have been so brilliantly. Uh, um, you know, advanced in their in technology by uh, the uh, fiber optic distributed temperature measurement uh, uh, center uh, under uh, uh, Professor Tyler. Uh, borehole electrical measurements, microgravity sometimes can uh, can help to uh, identify uh, uh, changes in the water table and uh, and uh, sources and sinks of uh, of uh, of groundwater. Here's a here's a really classical example that's also uh, I believe mentioned in the uh, in the text. It's the geometry of a Graben Valley aquifer from gravity and refraction. Okay, so we use two techniques together. Uh, you know, really uh, uh, increasing our our uh, our ability to distinguish what we want to see. This is done by Van Overmeeren in uh, I believe Western Argentina um, back uh, many years ago. And you can see uh, some lines where they've collected uh, gravity measurements, uh, much like we collected gravity measurements in uh, uh, over a, uh, uh, you know, not really over an area, not in a grid, but in, uh, you know, kind of a spider web of lines. And you draw a contour map from that. And um, instead of seeing an absolute uh, gravity low, you can kind of see a, uh, an inflection, a, a valley. 
in the uh, in the gravity. Okay, that uh, you know there's there's nothing uh, uh, too uh, apparent at the surface, but there are buried uh, channels here, which are uh, uh, leading to uh, uh, you know which are trapping water and, and are forming the principal um, the uh, uh, the principal aquifer in this in this area. So uh, you know these uh, buried uh, grobbins and channels. That's really the uh, um, that's really the the the. Uh, I'm sorry. This is in Chile, okay, uh, northern Chile, and um, uh, you know these are uh, 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 these are the things that. Uh, uh, and the kind of data that uh, that you might have, you know. So what can we what can we do with this? Okay. Uh, there's also uh, at the same place uh, there's a few refraction measurements. Uh, I'm sorry. Here's an example of uh, of gravity measurements along uh, uh, one profile, which I'm not sure I can pick out on the map, but uh, you can see a scattering of gravity measurements. All right, and um, uh, and and uh, so there's uh, data, and notice that the uh, you know the amount of the uh, of the gravity anomaly here, which is a low, right? It's uh, basically just one milligal, a one milligal anomaly, okay? And that one milligal anomaly gets generated by a, a very simple, uh, you know, at least simple in concept, uh, rift here, where we have um, basically increased thickness. Of uh, one formation, um, the very top formation, where the uh, where the grobbins are, okay, and uh, you know that increased thickness then leads to uh, an additional water resource. Now these grobbins ought to be uh, findable. The increased thickness of uh, of the uh, uh, of the surface uh, 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 low density of the surface sediment layer, okay. Which uh, I forgot to mention is is uh, you know above uh, volcanic layers and there's other sediment that's buried down below, uh, so it's in between volcanic layers, right? But um, we can look at the uh, at the top of the uh, volcanics and look for evidence of the grobbin, right? In the uh, um, by looking for the delay of uh, of, of seismic refraction waves over that uh, over that uh, the over that grommet. So here you can see uh, models um, uh, in as the solid lines, and then data as the uh, uh, as the round dots uh, from uh, a reverse seismic refraction survey. Okay, putting them together, and uh, you can see that that there's uh, you know not a perfect match here. You know they're not getting as low a velocity uh, as they might on uh, on either side, and they're not uh, they're not getting as much advance. You know when it when the the waves climb up the far side of the grobbin, um, according to the model, there should be a pretty big advance in time. Okay, um, but they are seeing the uh, uh, as as the waves go past the uh, um, you know this corner here, and go into the the grobbin, then they're significantly delayed. Okay, and you can see that you get the uh, volcanic velocity, and then their first arrival is lean back. Okay, there's the volcanic velocity, and then the first arrival is leaning back. Okay, and and uh, you know significantly offsetting these uh, uh, these travel times. Here's another uh, uh, another case history where we have um, a uh, in in uh, the upper Midwest uh, basically a flat plain of uh, of um, of till you know from the the Pleistocene glaciation. All right, there are uh, channels and you know basically holes and valleys in the in the bedrock and. If you um, uh, you know if you want to find if you want to find the uh, um, if you want to find the best aquifer, 
you've got to drill into the deepest part of it, okay? And then you'll be able to drain more uh, water out of the aquifer. You'll have a lot more uh, production capacity and, and a lot more recharge capacity also. All right. So uh, the objective is to find the deepest spot in the bedrock and drill there. Now this map here is, is after the analysis that I'll show you. Um, and it shows the, uh, the bedrock surface elevation. And, and about 40 meters higher is where the, uh, uh, the surface of the ground is. Okay, uh, And the surface of the ground is flat. And this bedrock surface elevation is hidden. And you can see as these black dots are the locations of, of wells that uh, were attempted. And notice that just you know by bad luck they had hit all the high points you know none of the low points in the uh, uh, in the bedrock surface so they were not able to produce as much water as they wanted okay and this is by uh, Rick Miller uh, so this map resulted from um, uh, work with uh, ultra high resolution seismic refre uh, seismic reflection and finding the reflection from the bedrock surface okay. Under all the all the till, and you can see here that the uh, the total travel, you know, the the, the two way travel time is uh, zero point one a tenth of a second at most, right? So it's not very deep, uh, but then you can essentially draw the uh, you can draw the depth of the of the bedrock uh, very very closely from the geometry of that of that reflection. Okay, now. Um, uh, in the elevation plot at the bottom, you know the elevation of the bedrock surface goes from maybe uh, eight uh, eight forty to uh, a maximum of uh, eight fifty two. So it's like twelve meters of of bedrock change. I mean, there's you know significant uh, uh, significant water resources in that uh, twelve meters, but uh, uh, not really uh, uh, not really enough. Uh, you know, bedrock uh, chain elevation change to give you a uh, very significant gravity anomaly. Maybe one, not one that you could measure very easily. Here's the surface elevation across the uh, the top, and the the seismic travel times are basically giving you the uh, depth to the uh, the bedrock underneath. And from that, you can uh, uh, you know calculate the volume of the reservoir, and you can also target your drilling to go into a very low low part of the uh, um, of the bedrock interface, thus giving you the your well the maximum ability to drain the uh, the water out of the formation. Here's an interesting uh, uh, example where the uh, uh, this is in the uh, uh, French Massif Central, where we have um, you know uh, igneous uh, bedrock, okay, uh, a, a bedrock pluton, all right. And uh, and then there's a a mar, an explosion crater, and then a, a cone that fills it, and the uh, the volcanics are actually much more porous than the uh, the surrounding uh, igneous bedrock. Okay, the the faulting that accompanies the mar, the uh, uh, the the cinder cone here is very very porous, um, and so. Um, you know, Albert uh, uh, some years ago, uh, you know, really uh, was able to uh, um, locate the uh, you know using magnetic data and magnetic modeling exclusively because the the volcanics were much more magnetic than the uh, than the surrounding bedrock. Uh, he was able to uh, you know very uh, ably uh, describe this uh, this feature of of fractured volcanics, which which creates in that area the the most prominent and most useful reservoir. Uh, and here's a uh, an example of looking at um, seismic reflection, where I've uh, emphasized some of the, the reflections here, to uh, uh, take a look at the uh, um, take a look at, at fracture zones and then drill into them and, and uh, do some borehole geophysics to uh, uh, to look at uh, at water movement. And when we talk about uh, when we talk about boreholes and, and borehole geophysics, then uh, downhole geophysics, then we'll be able to uh, say a bit more. But uh, suffice to say here that there are some fracture zones that are imaged as subhorizontal reflectors. There are other fracture zones that are uh, imaged here as uh, um, as uh, um, 
as they're they're not even shear, but they provide interruptions in the uh, subhorizontal fracturing, and uh, so it's really those those different fracture sets that provide the are the aquifers and provide the conduits for groundwater flow. So uh, that's a, a little survey of some uh, of some uh, uh, case histories that involve uh, potential fields. Um, and uh, I want to go on with uh, my own case history, uh, well, really one done by uh, my PhD student Rob Abbott, uh, and our definition of the uh, aquifer and the basin uh, and the seismic shaking hazard from the basin uh, right here in Reno and the trucking meadows. Um, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll move on to that. All right, so I'd like to uh, talk a bit about one particular gravity case history which was really important in uh, my career and has had a big effect on uh, a lot of the things that I've done since. Uh, this is um, the, um, the uh, gravity analysis that my student uh, Rob Abbott and I did of uh, Reno and uh, uh, the Truckee Meadows uh, Basin and also Eagle Valley, which is the basin that hosts Carson City. Lake Tahoe's over here. Here's Washoe Lake. Mount Rose is uh, over here, and uh, you can see uh, uh, the, the Nevada area of the figure here. And the uh, the issue is that, especially here in the Great Basin, we have all of these uh, sedimentary basins uh, set among these uh, more or less hard terrains. Uh, not all of them bedrock. For instance, the uh, Virginia Range here is made out of uh, uh, mostly tertiary volcanics uh, uh, just east of Reno. Uh, but uh, what we'd like to do is figure out um, if we can get a, a, a decent map of the uh, thickness of the sediments in the Truckee Meadows and also in Eagle Valley uh, from, uh, from gravity measurements. Okay. Now, this has uh, several implications. Uh, for instance, the uh, local water authority uh, withdraws uh, water from the Truckee River when, when it's uh, flowing well, uh, such as in the spring and early summer. And then uh, they inject it into the aquifer below the Truckee Meadows to, uh, to store it for the, uh, the drier periods. And this is in lieu of... Uh, you know, building even more giant reservoirs uh, uh, that would just lose water to evaporation. At least if you inject water into the aquifer, then you tend to lose uh, uh, very little, uh, as, and certainly none to evaporation. So that's one, uh, uh, that's one motivation. Another one is that um, these uh, sed sedimentary basins amplify seismic shaking. So, for instance, when the earthquake happened in Mogul, which is right here, uh, five years ago, uh, the uh, mostly the areas of the western Truckee Meadows, uh, which are apparently, uh, you know, on top of this uh, uh, relatively thick uh, sedimentary basin, uh, these areas, uh, these these basin areas, uh, shook uh, shook more prominently than uh, the uh, uh, the areas that, that are not covered with sediments. So uh, there's multiple, many multiple uh, uh, motivations for uh, using uh, gravity analysis to try to uh, analyze the, uh, the thickness of sediments in, in basins. And this is a big problem here in the, uh, um, in the Great Basin. So the work that Rob Abbott and I did really followed on from um, you know, real seminal work by uh, uh, Saltis and Jockins at the USGS, who in 1995 published a geophysical investigations map, which gave the thickness of every basin, um, at least every basin in the in the Great Basin east of uh, the California border here, north of Lake Tahoe, and uh, lots of basins in uh, eastern California in uh, Arizona, in Utah, in southern Idaho, uh, basically throughout the uh, Great Basin. You know, there's, there's almost 100 different valleys and basins. 
and uh, they came out with some results on each one. Uh, so that's a, a really fundamental piece of work uh, that uh, Saltus and Jockins map, and it's in the paper that accompanies it. Now, um, in the Truckee Meadows, there had been relatively little uh, gravity data available, and so the uh, as as you know, certainly uh, Saltus and Jockins's uh, results were better than none, um, but uh, we desired uh, much more uh, definitive geometry. Um, of the uh, of the Truckee Meadows Basin, okay, both for uh, water resources and earthquake hazard studies, and in fact, um, uh, this work did not stop with uh, with Rob Abbott and 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 my work. Um, several years later, uh, Washoe County collected even more gravity data, and uh, really sharpened up uh, in great detail the uh, gravity map in uh, in West Reno, and. We have their uh, their results as well, thanks to uh, Mike Widmer and Washoe County. So uh, the white dots uh, on this map, it's you see, it's the same map area. There's uh, Eagle Valley, Carson City, Lake Tahoe, and then the Truckee Meadows, Reno on the uh, west side, and Sparks on the east side. Okay, uh, the white dots indicate uh, for uh, Rob Abbott and my study a uh, Previously uh, existing gravity station. Okay, uh, these are out of national databases. Uh, you can see that uh, some areas have uh, pretty good gravity coverage, and this, in fact, is um, uh, an area called Pleasant Valley, uh, which is close to the geothermal, uh, re and this is over the geothermal resources of uh, the. Uh, uh, the geothermal resources of, of uh, uh, Steamboat Hills. Uh, these are also there's also points in here from uh, previous classes. Um, I think this is a 2000 and or no, I'm sorry, a 1994 class I think that got these points along Callahan Ranch Road and and going up uh, towards uh, Galena Creek. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there were not so many white points in the middle of the Truckee Meadows Basin. So now, instead of trying to acquire gravity on a on a nice even grid, okay, which might be ideal, but um, is uh, somewhat impractical, we acquired gravity along uh, prominent roadways, uh, well, or easy access roadways. So, you know, quiet streets are good, um, in kind of the spider web pattern here. Um, you know, and we we reached uh, through the middle of the basin, and then, you know, this white uh, white area that's uh, tertiary sediments. The darker gray is uh, is uh, uh, quaternary sediments, and then the stippled pattern, which I'm sure you can't see in the video, but you know, in the Mount Rose area and Peavine, you know, those are um, those are tertiary volcanics or uh, perhaps uh, uh, pre-tertiary uh, basement. So. Um, um, what we tried to do was was collect data from the uh, you know across the valley from one basement outcrop to another. Okay, and I'll explain shortly uh, why we uh, why we try to do it that way. So here is the uh, Bouguer gravity map that uh, Rob Abbott and I um, derived in the uh, late '90s and and uh, uh, and published in. Uh, in 2000, actually, in the journal Geophysics, and this is a, uh, a total, uh, um, you know, total uh, uh, Bouguer anomaly. So it's it's had all of the uh, all of the proper uh, terrain corrections and elevation corrections, um, and there are several. Uh, uh, and this this is the one uh, just of the the Truckee Meadows area. So. Uh, Double Diamond and Southern Truckee Meadows is down here. Uh, this is Steamboat Hills Geothermal Area. Um, you have the intersection of Interstate 80 and the Spaghetti Bowl Interchange with uh, US 395, uh, now known as 580, right here. University is right about here. You can see there's several gravity points on the university. Um, and uh, 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 and then we have uh, sparks over here, 
and let's see, Mount Rose Fan, where uh, there had been previous data. Now, you see there's uh, both uh, gray or black and white uh, points on this map. Now, the white points are those, let me make sure I get this right, uh, the white points are uh, gravity measurements taken on bedrock, okay, which we defined as tertiary volcanics um, or, uh, or, uh, or anything pre-tertiary. Okay. And then uh, the gray points uh, that, that uh, when they combine, they, they look black. Those are ones taken on sediment okay, in the basins. So um, you can see here uh, you know, one of our profiles with points in white on bedrock. And then as we're in the basin, uh, the points go to, uh, go to gray. And you can see that through uh, several basins. Okay. Um, and, and this is following the method of uh, Saltus and Jockins and how they, they got the method they, they got uh, uh, the uh, you know from, from the prior data set, they had gotten the, uh, uh, the basin gravity and the, uh, and the basin thickness of all of the uh, uh, all the basins in Nevada and, and other states and uh, and, and then, uh, um, uh, and derived uh, basin thickness in the Truckee Meadows and, and uh, everywhere else. Uh, so we were just trying to uh, use a similar method uh, and, uh, uh, and get more de detail in the Truckee Meadows. And you can see there are some points where there are uh, you know, single point anomalies like this one here, uh, south of Pleasant Valley, uh, north of uh, Washoe Valley. Okay, so there's the uh, entire Bouguer gravity map, and it contains anomalies from all kinds of things. It contains anomalies, you know, quite obviously this blue gravity hole here is from the basin in, um, uh, in the western side of the Truckee Meadows, and there's another sub-basin uh, in the eastern side of the Truckee Meadows in, in Sparks. Okay, so fair enough. And then um, uh, you know there are gravity highs here from the uh, uh, you know around the uh, uh, Virginia Range and the uh, volcanic hills to the north of uh, of Reno, uh, Peavine Mountain. Um, you know the Mount Rose Fan has a pretty low uh, gravity signature. Um, there's these gravity highs on the uh, on the on the north side of the fan. You know just south of uh, McCarran Boulevard. So uh, you know, there's all kinds of effects here. There's uh, you know gravity variations in the basement. There's gravity variations in the tertiary volcanics. There's also gravity variations due to the uh, the thickness of the sedimentary basin. You know, given that the sedimentary the sediments have uh, and ought to have uh, and and have been shown to have at least in some areas where we have well logs uh, borehole geophysics, the basin sediments have been shown to have lower density. Than, uh, than the uh, uh, than basement or uh, or tertiary uh, um, tertiary volcanics. Okay, so you know we can identify rather readily some features that are due to the basins, but like here in the in the Double Diamond area, the uh, Southern Truckee Meadows, you know it may be much more difficult to identify. And like, what's this? You know, here's a here's a hole here. Uh, but there's no basin in there. Okay, that's all. That's all basement rocks. Okay, so what we're going to try to do here is separate the influence of the bedrock from the influence of the basins. Okay, on the gravity. So what this is is a contour map of the gravity, the same Bouguer anomaly, but using only the uh, the points in white that are on the uh, that are on the basin. I'm sorry, on the bedrock. Okay, using only the points that are on the bedrock, and and of course, you know, we're missing. You know, the basins are pretty large, and we're missing any control on those uh, on those on the values of this bedrock gravity, so-called bedrock gravity. We're missing any control on it uh, that's within um, you know within the basins. And so, if there's a sub-basin uh, density anomaly in the bedrock, well, we're just going to have no control over it. Okay, and that's going to lead to some error, some uncertainty. Uh, now, we take this uh, 
uh, we take the the entire uh, the total Bouguer anomaly, okay, analyzed as you as you have uh, uh, as you have seen, all right. You know, calculate computed using all the all the corrections that, that you've heard about. Okay, we take the total Bouguer anomaly, we subtract the bedrock gravity, right? So even though we have uh, fewer bedrock points, you know, using computer codes, we can still make a contour map, and then at every at every point on the map. We can uh, we can subtract the bedrock gravity from the total gravity. What's left is uh, what we're presuming and assuming to be the gravity due to the basins and the basins only. Okay, so here you see uh, again, uh, you know, all the uh, all the points are mapped out in uh, in gray and white. Okay, and the uh, uh, but you can see that. That there's very little, uh, you know, in areas where we're well into the bedrock, right? There's, it's just orange because it's, uh, um, it's about uh, zero, okay. So uh, and if it's uh, if it's positive, right? We have uh, uh, it's it's going to the red, right? These are plus two milligal positives, and these are areas where there must be some kind of um, some kind of anomaly in the. Uh, in the bedrock, but we really don't have control. Uh, I really should go out and take a few more gravity points, uh, you know, on the edges of the hills to the north, right, and try to constrain those. But I haven't. Uh, oh well, you know, it's only been uh, 13 years. I haven't done that yet. Um, so that would be a, a good exercise. And um, what we see is that the uh, the basin gravity, you know, at the intersection of Mayberry and uh, West McCarran. Is like uh, minus uh, fifteen, uh, almost twenty milligals. Okay, uh, and there's also another low uh, at East I eighty in Sparks. You know, maybe centered around Legends, or uh, Sparks Boulevard and uh, and uh, and I eighty. Uh, that's uh, I think that goes to like minus ten uh, milligals. So the basin um, gravity anomaly is negative as it should be, right? Um, and it, it comes from you know the basin being a negative density anomaly compared to the surrounding bedrock. Uh, now there's some other uh, anomalies like here's places where the you know uh, instead of having a negative basin gravity anomaly we have positive right so that'll give a negative thickness which is obviously totally bogus uh, and we're going to have to ignore it you know knowing that that we have that error. Okay so the gravity just east of the university is like that. Uh, it's um, you know we don't really know what the basin gravity is, and we don't have good control from gravity what the the basin thickness is. And then um, uh, although we do have more data on that uh, uh, that I could talk about uh, uh, otherwise. Now here from one point in uh, Hidden Valley, okay, we didn't have any at the time. We didn't have any gravity measurements out here uh, to control this, so. Uh, you know the nearest gravity measurements were there and there and there and there and then back around here, and so the contour lines got stretched out, you know, across an obviously base uh, bedrock area. Okay, and so the basin appears to be larger than it really is. Okay, so that is that is basin gravity. Okay, and now we can analyze um, basin thickness. Okay, just by scaling using the simple Bouguer slab equation, as I've showed you, and what did we use here? I think we used a, an average basin density contrast of minus one third of a uh, gram per centimeter, minus zero point three three gram per uh, uh, centimeter uh, cubic centimeter. Okay, so we get a, uh, a basin thickness at Mayberry and McCarran of about uh, one kilometer in red. And uh, basin thickness of zero in blue out here. You know, out in uh, Verdi, we still have one or two hundred meters of, of basin thickness, and then we actually have a uh, um, you know a negative thickness, which is um, which is uh, uh, projected uh, as uh, the darker blue areas, which are obviously invalid. Okay, so this is a uh, a way of you know taking and identifying you know which which gravity points were taken on bedrock, and which gravity points were taken on the basin, 
okay, on sediment. Uh, we separated the two. We made uh, contour maps of each, and at each point on the map, in each point on the map grid, we we subtracted the uh, the the bedrock gravity from the total gravity, and the uh, what's left over is the basin gravity. And uh, and then that's easily uh, analyzed into uh, into uh, a depth. Okay, assuming the uh, infinite Bouguet slab. Okay. Uh, and here's a, uh, a contour map which uh, uh, compares the, uh, uh, maybe if I enlarge it a little bit, uh, uh, you might be able to see some more of it. Uh, this contour map uh, compares well data with the, uh, um, with the basin thicknesses gotten from gravity. So you know, looking here, this 400 meter contour, which uh, intersects uh, in the Moana geothermal area, you know, Moana and, and uh, um, and Virginia Lake and uh, uh, Moana Street and uh, Virginia Street. Okay, there are several geothermal wells which have penetrated basement. And on this figure, the uh, this is from the uh, the 2000 geophysics paper by Abbott and Louis. Um, we have the uh, the depth uh, uh, where known to uh, uh, to basement as the uh, dark circles. Okay, so like 416 meters, and it's Pretty close to the uh, 400 meter contour line, um, and then uh, some places where we have a uh, uh, a larger uh, uh, where we where the drill hole did not reach basement, did not reach bedrock. Okay, uh, we just know, for instance, this one here, which is a actually a 1908 oil wildcat in Southwest Reno. Okay, amazing, but they they really did drill it, and the USGS wrote a report on it. Okay. So that oil wildcat uh, stopped in the middle of, of sediment at uh, 576 meters depth, and so this white circle then says you know greater than 576. Okay, and we have the same thing uh, all around. So um, you know there are places where it's clearly not working. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, up here uh, where we know that it's greater than uh, 200 meters, but uh, you know, we're within the. Uh, you know, there's the zero contour right there, uh, at the uh, at the spaghetti bowl, and we know we know that's not right. That's due to, you know, um, incomplete characterization of the uh, of the bedrock gravity. Um, this, and the 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 gravity measurement points are also shown on here, um, both uh, prior and uh, and current, and you can see how uh, I really need to get some data across. The northern part of campus here, and and uh, out east, you know, like along uh, uh, Timber uh, Way and such. So now here is a uh, a modeled um, um, cross section east west across the basin. You're going to look at this in your gravity lab, all right. And uh, and here's the data you'll get in your in your gravity lab. We've got the uh, uh, the observed gravity as the as the points. And then uh, you know the calculation from this two D model uh, as the uh, um, as the line, and let's see the line is going to go right across here. So we're trying to go across the deepest point where the the thickness is just barely over a thousand meters, one kilometer of uh, sediment thickness. And here are the uh, the wells. Uh, some of them projected into this section. Um, you know, showing the depth to uh, to basement rock, uh, and then in the modeling, instead of just using the simple Bouguet slab and one single density contrast, which we're assuming is constant everywhere, we actually had the uh, uh, the latitude uh, using uh, uh, GeoSoft and and the uh, uh, the GMSIS uh, gravity magnetic modeling package that goes with that. Okay, we can um, we can actually uh, uh, get the uh, uh, we can actually put in different densities at different uh, parts of the basins, you know, like drawing uh, polygons of different density. And the, um, for instance, uh, here in the this this big gravity low of uh, you know almost fifteen milligals is caused by uh, this uh, very light diatomaceous sandstone, uh, uh, you know, only two grams uh, per cc. 
you know, where a standard alluvium, uh, you know, in this area has 2.3 grams per cc. Okay, so the diatomaceous sandstone has a big effect uh, on this, and uh, you know, Rob's modeling um, is uh, was very important here. Now, the uh, uh, the fault that we uh, we suppose we found, uh, we've we've revised that several times. This has become a, a product of uh, of much uh, further investigation, and I don't think currently I don't think it actually uh, the recent active fault. I don't think it it uh, dips to the uh, east. I think we have the same tertiary fault, which has been active uh, from uh, and it's west dipping. It's normal and it's been active uh, since the tertiary right up uh, till today. We found so there were some conclusions here that had to be uh, had to be revised. But you know, from the uh, the map of, of basin thickness um, and the uh, um, and the and the model cross section, uh, we have good confidence. Uh, you know, in the correlation with the uh, uh, the depths to basement uh, shown by the wells, I uh, really have good confidence that uh, this uh, very really very simple uh, you know gravity map subtraction technique. Uh, uh, is giving us some some details, some sense of what's going on in our in our Truckee Meadows Basin, and we've recently expanded this uh, well to many places. But uh, most recently, uh, Gretchen Schmouter and her thesis work has expanded it to South Lake Tahoe, and we have a uh, a basin gravity map now for South Lake Tahoe with its attendant um, uh, with its attendant uh, modeled uh, 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 well. It's attendant uh, Bouguer slab simple calculation for thickness as as this map is showing, okay, and uh, and and many other spots. Um, now, what you're going to do in the gravity lab, which will start this week, is uh, you'll learn how to uh, do an actual gravity inversion uh, for this uh, for a profile of data of gravity data like this, um, where you'll basically get to to look at uh, you know, basin thickness data uh, all along the profile, and have that uh, determined automatically. And we're going to see the ins and outs, and the the hazards and the advantages of uh, doing an inversion for uh, such a a basin profile from gravity. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention that this cross section here is at five times vertical exaggeration. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, we're going to actually move on to electrical techniques in the uh, in the next lecture.